thank you for joining us and introduce you to Igby. So since this is an introduction right from scratch, I want to show you this. This is the BioDiz home, biodiz.org, and this is the home page for Igby. You can, right over here, immediately download any of the, the uh, versions, or you can go to the download page. Additionally, on the home page, you can get access to the user's guide or the help form. And the help form looks like this. This is SourceForge for the Genovis project. And if you go to discussion, you can see that there's a help form and just an open discussion form. Um, the, the size of the memory is how much memory you're going to give Igby to actually use while it's running on your computer. If you're running a Mac, generally you're very safe using either the 2 or 5 gigabyte. Unfortunately, the way Windows works is even if you have 4 gig of memory, a huge amount of that memory is being used up by the actual operating system. So typically we recommend using the slightly smaller size if you're running it on Windows, just be, by the nature of the Windows machine. So when you click this, the very first time, what will happen is it will start Java on your computer and it's called a web start and it will actually start the program running on your computer. It's not a web program, it's actually a computer program. The very first time you open it, what will also happen is in your default browser, it will open you to the quick start page, which is right here in the user manual, just to help you get started. So pretty much I'm going to be taking you through this quick start today, as well as showing off some of the other features of Igby. So I'm going to get this out of the way. And obviously I have made the screen full size so that you can all easily see it. But this is the starting page of Igby. And what you can see here across these pictures, and you can see quite a lot of them if you zoom around, there's lots of plants, there's lots of animals. These are the quick one-click jumps that will take you to the genome that you're interested in. Since my lab studies Arabidopsis, um, we're going to click on Arabidopsis thaliana. Now, by clicking on this, you can see over here in the current genome that it's pre-selected to Arabidopsis, and it's going to load the current version, and it will automatically load all of the annotations that are publicly available for the first chromosome. Now, there's obviously many, many more species available than on that front page. We just made the most popular easy by using one click. Additionally, you can see that we host three different um, genome assemblies here, and so a variety of all of the different species have anywhere from one to ten genome versions that are publicly available. So you'll be able to select the one you want. And if none of that is good enough for you, you can always just create your own by dragging your files in and choosing the reference sequence that you'd like. But since we're doing this as a quick start, literally, you most people can just click straight on one of those pictures and get to the information that they want. So next, how do you get your file to open up in Igby? Well, there's three different methods. First, you can use open file or open URL. If we click this, it literally is just a file selection tree on your computer. I can go to where I know I have some of our data. In fact, it's called our data. And it will show me all of the known types that Igby can see. So for instance, here are BAM files and SAM files. That is, 
They are alignment files where short reads of sequence have been sequenced on an Illumina platform and aligned onto this genome. You can also visualize as a track sequence material. You can load a variety of different graph styles. I have bed files as well as GFF files, and all of these can readily be opened in Igby. Another way to do it is to literally just open on your desktop the file that you're interested in. Here's my finder, and once again, I can go down and pick up and drag in any file. Simply drag and drop it onto the frame, and Igby will open it. The one other thing that you can do, depending on what genome it is, is over here in the corner. The available data is the data that is supported on the servers that Igby can see. And as I mentioned, our lab does a lot of work with Arabidopsis. So we actually have loaded in here, the Lorraine lab, a variety of sample data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this data as an example, and I'm going to select the two files that I want to load. And if you notice, as I check them, and the same thing would happen if you selected it from the file chooser, or if you dragged it in, Igby creates placeholder tracks and lists your files in the track name list. The reason it does not instantly load your data is that, especially for these alignment type files, you can have up to 300 million or more single sequences within that single file. And if you were to try to load all of that, you would completely use up all of the memory in a computer and crash the computer. So what Igby does instead is it opens it. It shows you where it's going to go. It shows you that it's present. And now it's up to you to go find the, the gene or region that you're interested in. You can select it by clicking on the chromosome you're interested in. You can click, as you see, this is called a zoom stripe because as we zoom in, that stripe is the center and all of the information flows away from it. Very interesting if, uh, feature of Igby is called semantic zooming. You can notice that as we start to zoom in, these single hash marks begin to display the elements of gene models, introns and exons. And as we zoom in more and more, we begin, to, we begin to pick up the details of gene names, for instance. And if I have the sequence already loaded, you can see it as this gray bar. As we zoom in further and further, first of all, you can see where transcription begins and where translation begins. Again, even further, and we start to see the sequence, each nucleotide is color coded, and we begin to see the codon layout. And if we zoom in far enough, we begin to see the actual nucleotides and amino acid designations along this model. But again, the zooming flows when you use this zoom bar. Now, there's a variety of ways to jump around as well. If you, for instance, double click on a gene model or an element, you jump immediately to that gene. You can also use the search function. And here I'll show you the search function for our favorite gene. By putting that in to the search engine, we get a search list showing us all the things that matched. And by double clicking any part of that list, we jump straight to that feature. So here we have this gene that I'm going to show you. Now that we've zoomed in on a gene or a region, I can even expand the region a little bit. I'm going to click the load data button. Now you can see down here, it tells you that it's in the process of loading. And there, popped up is all of the alignments 
in that area. It's now loaded all the data from those files in this region. If we zoom out a little more, you'll see there's areas that are not loaded. They're shown by the darker gray. It loaded the information we were interested in and so did not overrun any of the memory we were interested in. The other thing I did is, if you notice, I went from the Advanced Search tab back to the Data Access tab. IGBI is, is designed to really allow you to customize your experience. Different people are going to look at their data and analyze it in a multitude of different ways. And as such, they may want to change what they're seeing, both by color, by order, etc. So the first thing we're going to do here is, I don't like these long names. I find them confusing when I do my analysis. So I'm going to come back down here to the track name, and I'm going to click on the name, and I'm going to edit it into something that I like, and hit return. And as soon as I hit return, you can see that the name changes. So I'm going to adjust the names of my tracks. Now, IGBI doesn't forget where these came from. You can still find out, okay, where did that file come from by selecting, that is, I click on the name, and I go to Selection Info, and it tells me where I got this file from. So now I've adjusted the names, but there's still quite a few other adjustments I'd like to make. Since I have so many of these, and they're all annotations, that is, they are representations, they're models of the data. I'm going to come to the annotation tab. One of the things that I prefer is I like them all to have a white background. So I choose Select All and I choose the background color and it draws them white. I also, to save space, I like to have my plus and minus strand shown as a single strand. So I select one of those two and I ask it to combine them for me. Again, since the arrows are in place, I know which direction the gene is running. Now, again, I happen to like a different color scheme. I like a lighter orange for my primary annotations, that is the gene models, and I want a slightly lighter green for my control, and I would like a slightly lighter blue for my, for my cold treated samples. And so I can customize this to whatever color scheme appeals to me. Now, one of the things that can happen, of course, is the track labels become very white. Well, in all cases, we can actually change the track label. In this case, I'm going to make it black. And then I'm actually going to change the font so that all of the words are large and immediately obvious. And here you go. And then finally, if I wanted to see cold against these models, I can change the order of the tracks by simply clicking and dragging it to the new position. So as you can see, you can definitely modify what is present in the visual field to make it easier on yourself. And in fact, sometimes this amount of room is not even enough. We allow you to hide both of these trays to get it out of the field of view. So now you have maximized the field of view so that you can do your analysis. Simply clicking on any one of the tabs as well as the arrow will immediately open it back up. You're ready to actually go forward and do any sort of analysis. So before we actually start using some of the more analytical functions in IGBI, I'd like to point out a few key tricks to further maximize the visual field. Since you can sometimes have up to 16 of these tracks going at one time, you can really begin to push your visual information out of the way. So one of the key elements of IGBI, IGBI loads all of the information in the region, but it draws for you, at default, 10 rows of data, and then gives an approximate summary row of the rest of the data.
This could be one row, this could be one million rows, and it all depends on your data. However, we feel that giving you the first 10 at least lets you begin to look at the information. It is very easy to be able to see everything within that track. Select the track, and you can either use this button or this function called optimize. We call this stack height. So right now you can see the stack height. In other words, how many rows are stacked on top of each other? It's set to 10. You could, if you wanted to, enter a number and apply that. And now it will show me up to 100 rows. And you can see that the data begins to start getting pushed off the screen on either side. But you can see we still have a summary row here telling us that there's still even more data. If you use the optimize button, it will draw for you everything. But again, this is not always the ideal way to look at your data because there's really not that much you can see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset this back down to 10. Now in the quite the opposite direction, you can see that this track only has four as the highest stack and it is set to 10. If I choose to optimize this, we get rid of the white space and it shows you exactly four high and an empty summary row. Now, again, as I showed you, if you increase the amount of data, you can really start to push this stuff off the screen. And at least for the annotations, we'd always like to keep them in view. So one of the things we can do for track height is we can choose to lock the height of a track so that it never changes. In this case, I'm going to set it to 100. And what this will do is it will set the track height to exactly 100 pixels. So that if again, I choose to optimize, notice this track did not get small and pushed aside like that track did. On the other hand, if I were to increase the visible space by dropping the tray, notice these tracks got taller. This stayed exactly 100 pixels. So understanding what the track height and what the stack height does for you will help you choose how much data you want to see on the screen at a time as well as what data you want to keep to a very specific visible size.